here's the setting. Let's say I have four fertilizers. I would like to determine which of those four fertilizers work best with my rice. What do I mean by best? I mean which one produces the highest yield? Notice a couple things about how this is set up. There's two variables. Variable one is the dependent variable. It's the yield. Variable 2 is the fertilizer type. It's the independent variable. Why is the fertilizer type the independent variable and the yield the dependent variable? Well, which comes first in the planting season? The giving of the, the applying of the fertilizer the treatment, or the harvesting and determining the yield. Well, the yield happens last. Because the fertilizer comes before the yield, the fertilizer has to be the independent variable. The yield cannot be the independent variable in that case. This is a very typical problem that's set up in a uh, problem in the, that we an analyze. Um, the independent variable is categorical. Not just categorical, but it has four categories. And not just four categories, and not just categorical, but nominal. It doesn't matter the order that we list these fertilizers. We list them as fertilizer A, B, C, D. We list them as fertilizer A, D, C, B. The order doesn't matter. Independent variable being nominal, dependent variable being numeric, that tells me that I should be using some sort of analysis of variance. This rice example is going to undergird all of this lecture, by the way. Dependent variable, independent variable. What's the null hypothesis? Well, the null hypothesis, remember null means none. So the null hypothesis is that there's no difference amongst these four fertilizers. So the average yield for fertilizer A is going to be the same as the average yield for fertilizer B. It's going to equal the average yield for fertilizer C. is equal to the average yield for fertilizer D. Average yield, we're going to in indicate that with a mu. It's a Greek letter, so this is the population. We're trying to learn about the effect of the fertilizer on all rice, not just the samples that I have. If that's the null hypothesis, then the alternative is the logical opposite, that at least one of the averages is not the same as the other. formulate this a little bit better. Let's make an assumption, the usual assumption of normality, and let's write what this would look like using a linear model. So let me erase. That's our population. Circles are our, are our samples. Circle A is the sample that we apply fertilizer A to. Circle B is the sample that we apply fertilizer B to. 
Circle C is the uh, sample that we applied fertilizer C to. What is D? The sample that we applied fertilizer D to. R2, D2. If the averages of these three are the same, that is, if the null hypothesis is true, then the yield that we get from any rice plant, that's an I, is going to equal an overall mean. It's an overall mean. Notice there's no subscripts. And that mean is not going to depend upon the fertilizer you apply. Plus that randomness. Not every rice plant grows the same amount. There's a natural variation involved. That's what this epsilon sub i is. The natural variation within plant i. Mu indicates that it's an average overall. And since there's no subscript A, B, C, or D, that means that mu A equals mu B equals mu C equals mu D equals this mu. And this Y sub I is just the observed yield for plant I. Notice that we have broken it down into a overall mean and a deviation from that mean. A systematic part and a random part. null hypothesis. If this is the null hypothesis, then the alternative, where at least one difference, is going to be this. I's and J's. The yield of plant I in treatment J is equal to the overall average in treatment J plus that random effect, that random part. So if we're looking at this rice plant, whatever rice plants look like, and this is rice plant 1 in group A, we could also write that as Y1A is equal to mu A plus that randomness associated with plant, e, uh, plant 1A. That's what the subscripts mean. The J is the treatment. The I is the observation in that sample, in that treatment. Systematic part, random part. By the way, this is referred to as the means model. because it emphasizes that the average yield in each of the four groups can be different. There's an alternative way of looking at this means model. It's the effects model. Completely identical, but it does help to see things in this way every once in a while. Again, yield, plant I in treatment J, is equal to an overall yield, overall average yield, plus the effect of treatment J, the effect of treatment J, that's why it's called the effects model, plus that randomness. Notice a couple things. That's the same. That's the same. And all we did was decompose this decompose this mu sub j into an overall mean and an effect. And that's why it's called the effects model. There's one thing I like about the effects model. And here's what it is. 
current variable is going to reduce the unexplained variation. We're going to understand more if we add this variable. Because the yi and the yij are the same, just a different numeration. The mu's are the same, it's the average yield. So this tau sub j had to come from that random part. It's not the random part, but that's where it came from. If the tau sub j's are all zero, if these are all zero, what does that mean? It means that these means are all the same. If the tau sub j's are all zero, it also means that the random part hasn't been reduced. If there is some value in the tau sub j's, that is, that is if tau sub a is not the same as any of the others, null hypothesis is wrong, because at least one differs. And this unexplained variance, this epsilon sub ij, is going to be less than the epsilon sub i. And that's key to understanding why we're doing this analysis of variance. Think about this for a moment. And so analysis of variance actually gets at comparing the random part of the null model, the model under the null hypothesis is called the null model, comparing the random part under the null uh, model to the random part under the model. Again, this, this epsilon sub ij is still the random part. If the random part is suitably less, the random part in the alternative model is suitably less than the random part in the null model, then we've shown that these t sub j, these tau sub j's, are not zero. We've shown that since these tau sub j's are not zero, this mu sub tau j is not going to be the same number in each of the four fertilizers. Because the effect is non-zero for at least one of the four groups, we've disproven the null hypothesis. We've concluded that at least one average differs. So at this point, we start to pay attention to the epsilon sub i's in the null model and the epsilon sub ij in the alternative model. And, that, and actually, we don't look at the epsilons themselves. We look at the squares of the epsilons. If we square these epsilons, we're going to get closer to a type of variance. We'll just call it a variation. Because these epsilons, this epsilon can be written as value minus its mean squared. That looks like the start of the formula for a variance, and it is. And the bottom, this is going to be sub ij is yij minus mu minus tau j. We square those, and look, an observation subtracting off its expected value squared. It's another variance. We're going to eventually end up into a test statistic that's a ratio of two variances. You notice I keep saying the word variance. Even though we're looking at means, it reduces to looking at variances. And that's why this is called analysis of variance. We're comparing variances. Now let's go backwards for a moment. If this variance is not too different from this variance, then that means that this epsilon sub ij is not too much different from the epsilon sub i's. Since the epsilon sub i's and the epsilon sub ij's are, going to be, are pretty close, that means these tau sub j's are almost zero. If the tau sub j's are almost zero, there's no difference in the mu's. Failed reject no hypothesis. If these epsilon sub ij squares are very much less than the epsilon sub i squares, that means the epsilon sub ij is very much less than the epsilon sub i on average. 
which means these tau j's are not zero. If these tau j's are not zero, that means at least one average differs from the other. We're going to look at the variance. We're going to look at the ratio of variances of the null model and the alternative model. We're going to do a little mathematics there, and we're going to come up with the F-test, the analysis of variance test. So let's delve into the mathematics. So let's change our graphic now. Let's go from circles and dots, circles and squares, and letters to dots and lines and letters. We'll represent the yield. So vertical axis, or this axis will be yield. Horizontal is going to be our fertilizer type. I'll just draw dots for the fertilizer type. So those are the four yields for the rice when we use fertilizer A. Four yields of rice when we use fertilizer B. Those will be the ones for C. Let's do something really different. And those will be the yields for fertilizer. So we've got 16 in our sample. So capital N equals 16. In sample, in sample A, we have a sample size of 4. Oops. Okay, so A equals 4. Sample B, N is 4. Same with C and D. Now, a little bit of terminology. Because the sample size in each of the samples is the same, this is called a balanced design. It's a word you'll come across every once in a while. It's not too important nowadays. It was very important when Fisher first came up with the analysis of variance design, um, simply because it made math a lot easier. Capital N is going to be our total sample size. It's going to equal N sub A plus N sub B plus N plus C, N sub C plus N sub D. Okay. Next, recall the null hypotheses. There's mu sub A is equal to mu sub B equals mu sub C equals mu sub D. Since they're all equal, it's going to be equal to that grand mean mu. Okay, I do want to emphasize Mu is a Greek letter, therefore it refers to the population, not to the sample. Greek letters refer to the population, not the sample. Alternative. Yeah. Is that at least one average differs? What does that mean in our picture? Well, it means this. Let's use red for the alternative uh, for the null hypothesis. That if all the means are equal, then let's make that a Y bar. If all the means are equal, then they're all going to be the same which means we can use one mean to represent the entire group. I'm using y bar because now I'm using the sample to get information. Mu would be the population, y bar is going to be the sample. In fact, I'm going to use y bar dot dot. I'm going to try to use the dot notation. I don't like it, but such is life. y bar 
bar means an average over variable y. y has two subscripts, an i and a j. Since we're using dots, that means that we're summing over each of those two subscripts. So this is another way of writing sum i equals 1, 2, 4, because there's four fertilizers. j equals 1 to 4, because in each of those fertilizers, there's four in the sample of y sub ij, and then divided by the total sample size. This is the grand mean. Grand mean, double dots. You're adding up everything, all the yields, dividing by total number of yields that you added together, 16. So in the null hypothesis, this y bar dot dot is going to be our mean for the entire group, all four groups. The alternative is that at least one differs. Which means each individual mean is free to be different from the others. Again, since we're not working with the population, we're working with the sample, we'll be using y bars. This is y bar dot a. y bar, because it's an average of yields. A, because it's in group A, and dot, you're summing over all of those I's. So this is just the sample mean of group A. And this looks like the sample mean of group B. That looks like the sample mean of group C. And now that looks like the sample mean of group D. And just to be clear on the, on the formula, this y bar dot d, you're adding up i equals 1 to 4, of y sub i d, and then you're dividing by n sub d. It's an average. It's a sample mean. You're just adding up over all the values in group d, and dividing by that total number of values. One of the hardest things about analysis of variance and all of these experimental designs that we're going to be learning is keeping track of that notation. It's even worse because books use different notation. We'll deal with it. Remember I said this was analysis of variance, and we're going to be dealing with several variances. First variance we're going to be dealing with is the overall variance, or the total variance. Before we talk about the total variance, we're going to talk about the total sum of squares. Total sum of squares. We're adding up over all the points. We're finding the difference between point yield for price ij and the overall mean. Adding up over all the data points, all 16 of them, the difference between that data point and the grand mean. This is called the total sum of squares. And it's going to measure how well the null model fits the data. A measure of how well the null model fits the data. No, this is not the measure. It's a measure. We're going to have to create something called, let's see, what, how does the book actually call it? The book calls it sum of squares between. Now remember the goal. 
we were comparing variances or variations of the null model and the alternative model. This sum of squares between is the amount of variation that's described or explained by our model. It's the sum of square differences between the groups. So this is going to be, again, adding up over all the data points. It's going to be the difference between the mean of the groups and the grand mean. of how much variation is explained by the model. This is going to be a measure of how much good we did by freeing up the requirement that the means were all equal and allowing the means and the groups to vary. And the last one is going to be sum of squares within. The book uses SSW. This is going to be the measurement of variation that's left over. This is the total variation. This is what the model explains. And this is what the model doesn't explain. This is the variation between the groups. This is going to be the variation that's, that remains, residual variation. This is also sometimes called SSE, sum of squared errors. Again, we're going to add, add up over all the data points. What are we going to add up? We're going to add up the difference between what we observe and the average in the group. J minus y bar dot dot. I'm going to do this in gray. Old trick in mathematics is to add and subtract the same number and don't change things. we're adding and subtracting y bar dot j. This is the same as this, mathematically in every other way. Because I wanted to use blue at some point. y i j minus y dot y bar dot dot y i j minus y dot bar j y dot j bar minus y dot dot bar. Now the really interesting thing. That's also true. The reason it's true is not obvious. Without the squares, I mean, that's high school math showed that that's true. With the squares, it's not obvious. In fact, first reaction is, no, that, that can't be true. But here's why it's true. Remember this, using a smile, it's going to be equal to this plus this plus that times that. Well, it turns out that the yij minus y dot bar j times the y dot bar j minus y dot dot bar this parenthesis part times this parenthesis part is equal to zero. Why? Because y dot dot bar is 1 over n If you work through this multiplication, you'll see where this pops up. 
When you add up over all this, you're going to end up with a zero in that cross product. And it drops out. What that means is this squared error and this squared error are independent of each other. That's kind of important. This error and this error, this variation and this variation, independent of each other, that's, that's astounding. Why? Because when you make test statistics that are ratios, the numerator and denominator need to be independent of each other. Otherwise, the test statistic does not work. What are the two parts that are independent? That and that are independent. So the ratio of this divided by its degrees of freedom to this divided by its degrees of freedom is going to give you a test statistic that we can actually work with, that we can tabulate, that we can find an equation for, which means we can do all the statistic stuff that we ever want to do. Because we've got a distribution for that test statistic. But, that's not five minutes in the future. Go ahead and take a look at this and make sure it makes sense. You may want to hit pause. Okay, let's move on. Now, I did notice that in the recording that kind of got cut off right about here. The TSS formula, the SSB, and the SSW formulas are all in the book. They're all in the book on page 255. So I'll go ahead and let you check those out. This is just the grand mean formula. So the next step is to create that test statistic. And it's got to be a test statistic that's meaningful. Kind of got that with the independence. And here it is. We know that the ratio of variances, independent variances, has an F distribution. Why do we know that? Because that's how we created the F distribution. SSB is equal to the sum over all the data values. I'm not going to worry about the i equals 1 to 4 and the j equals 1 to 4. Of y dot j bar minus y dot dot bar squared. That's not a variance, though. I said the ratio of independent variances follows an F distribution. To turn this into a variance, as always, all we have to do is divide by the number of degrees of freedom. That's it. Back in, in stat one, we calculated the variance, sample variance. It was x, it was yi minus y bar squared, added all the way up, divided by n minus one. Number of degrees of freedom was n minus one. Here, the number of degrees of freedom for SSB is the number of groups minus 1. So the mean squared explained by this model, or the mean squared between, is equal to 1 over, what, what variable do they use for number of groups? T. Okay. We have four groups, four fertilizers, so four groups. So T is four in our case. In general, it's T. That's the formula for the mean squared between. Just sum of squared between, and the summation is over all the data points. And the book does a really nice job there. They subscript that with all, you just mean you're adding up over all the data points. SSW, I'm going to call this SSE, it means exactly the same thing. Just SSE stands for sum of squared errors. And this really is what's left over, the errors that are left over. So instead of SSW, it's going to be SSE. That's going to be over all of yij minus y bar dot j. That's what I have over there, except I'm now calling it some of squared errors. 
It's an error because it's what you observe minus what you predict in that group. What you observe minus what you predict. Observed minus expected. It's an error. So the mean squared error is just the sum of squared errors divided by its number of degrees of freedom. Its number of degrees of freedom is going to be the total sample size minus the number of treatments or the number of groups. N minus T. Notice that's a capital N. In our case, that's going to be 16. T is 4, the number of groups. And our test statistic, F, is going to be the ratio between those two. Test statistic F follows an F distribution. Thankfully, otherwise we would have called it something else. Uh, F distribution requires two types of degrees of freedom. It requires a numerator degree of freedom and a denominator degree of freedom. The numerator degree of freedom is t minus 1. What's the denominator degree of freedom? n minus t. From this, we can go to the back of the book to, get, uh, to use our table. We'll have an example where I go through and do all this calculation by hand with genuine numbers. Then we'll look in the table itself. I do need to mention one thing at this point. This F statistic has an F distribution if mean squared between and mean squared error are independent which I left as an exercise for you. All you had to do is show that the cross term is zero. And if the mean squared between and the mean squared error themselves are chi-squared distributions. That's how we defined our F distribution. Now, the mean squared error and the mean squared between have chi-squared distributions if the y's are normally distributed. That's where the assumption of normality comes in. It's not just that the y's are nor normally distributed. It's that the y's in each of the groups are normally distributed. Plus that the variances within each of the groups are equal. So this has our f distribution, but it requires two assumptions. that if our yields, given our fertilizer type, is normally distributed, and if the variances of our yields in each of our groups is constant. It doesn't matter what that constant is, it just has to be constant. Now, if you go back a few minutes and you look at the dot plot that I put up there, it looks like they're constant. I designed it that way. So it appears as though this is met by our data. And normally distributed, I mean, seriously, four data points in each group, you're not going to be able to reject normality. So both of these, neither of these are violated with our dot plot example, which means that the ratio of these two mean squares is going to have an F distribution, degrees of freedom numerator t minus 1, Degrees of freedom denominator and minus t. Wow, that was a lot of work. That was a lot. And this is just the simplest of our designs. Next, you should watch the video on going through a, a, a practice problem by hand. That'll be helpful. So here's our hand example. Um, let's go ahead and Use rice yield, I guess. We can call each of those rice yields. Uh, let's narrow it down to just three fertilizers I want to compare because a lot of calculations. Not, I'm not a fan of that. 
So fertilizer A produces rice yields of 7.66, 6.98, and 7.80. Fertilizer B produces rice yields of 5.26, 5.44, and 5.80. Fertilizer C produces rice yields of 7.41, 7.33, and 7.04. So let's go ahead and do some calculations. First thing I want to calculate is sum of squares between. And by the way, you want to copy this down because it's going to go away pretty soon. And then we're going to calculate sum of squares within, or sum of squared errors. We're going to have to eventually calculate total sum of squares. And that'll probably be the easiest. We're going to want to calculate degrees of freedom for each of those. Uh, we're going to want to calculate mean squares between mean squared error. And we don't need the mean squared total. It doesn't tell us anything. We're then going to have to calculate the ratio of these two. That'll be our F statistic. Then we're going to go to the tables to see if we can find some sort of p-value or whether or not we can reject the null hypothesis. So that's the plan. This is actually what's going to be called an analysis of variance table. Um, there's our data. So the first thing, sum of squares between. Again, we're going to sum up over all the data, and by this point the book doesn't even bother with the subscript, and I like that about the book. Um, sum of squares between is going to be adding up over all the data, the difference between the grand mean and the individual means. That means that we have to calculate the grand mean, and it also means that we have to calculate the grouped means. Okay, um, yeah, so I'm going to pause and do those calculations. So after uh, quite a bit of work, um, group A's sample mean, this would be y bar dot A, this would be y bar dot B, and y bar dot C. These are just the sample means within each of the three samples. This is the grand mean. It's the mean of everything together. It's 6.746666666666, etc. Unfortunately, I round it to 67. We're going to need that for the sum of squares between, which we recall we add up over all the data points, all nine of them. Difference between the grand mean and the group mean. So for this first data point, this is going to be the grand mean minus the group mean. 6.7467 minus 7.48 squared. For this data point, it's going to be the grand mean minus the group mean squared. For this data point, it's going to be the grand mean minus the group mean squared. For this data point, it's going to be the grand mean minus this group mean. 6.7467 minus 5.50 squared. For this data point, it's going to be the grand mean minus group mean squared. For this data point, it's going to be the grand mean minus group mean squared. And then, for this data point, it's the grand mean minus group mean squared. 6.7467 minus 7.26 squared. For this data point, it's going to be the grand mean minus group mean. And for this last ninth data point, grand mean minus group mean. A lot of calculations involved here. So I need to calculate 6.7467 minus 7.48 squared plus 6.7467 minus 7.48 squared plus 6.7467 minus 7.48 squared plus 6.7467 minus 5.50 squared plus 6.7467 minus 5.50 squared plus 6.7467 minus 5.50 squared plus 6.7467 minus 7.26 squared plus 7, etc. Adding all that up, you get a sum of squares between the 7.0664. That was a lot of work. Now that we've got the sum of squares between, remember it's the mean squared between that we actually want. The mean squared between is just going to be the sum of squares between minus degrees of freedom between. Degrees of freedom between is the number of data points, I mean, sorry, number of groups, 3 minus 1. T minus 1 in this case is 2. 
So mean squared between is 7.0664 divided by 2, which is 3.5332. That's a lot of work. And we're going to do the same thing with the sum of squared errors, or the sum of squared with m. I'm going to do some erasing. I'm going to do the sum of squared error formula. I'm going to do all the calculations. But I'm going to do it when I pause it, so you pause. Do the calculations yourself and make sure that we come up with the same answer. And here we are with the sum of square errors or the sum of squares within. Formula again is you're adding up over all the data points, the difference between the observation and what you predict for that observation. This, the y bar dot j, comes from our model. So what this is doing is finding the variation between what you observe and what your model says should be there. Subtracted, squared, added up. So for the first over all the data points. So for the first data point, 7.66 minus that 7.48. 7.66 minus that 7.48, because this is what you predict for fertilizer A. Squared plus 6.98, this residual, or this error, or this deviation, squared. Plus 7.80 minus 7.48 squared plus 5.26 minus 5.50 squared plus 5.44 minus 5.50 squared plus 5.80 minus 5.50 squared plus, and then you do it for the last column again. 7.41 minus 7.26 squared plus 7.33 minus 7.26 squared plus 7.04 minus 7.26 squared. Do all that calculation using your fingers and toes, or a calculator, you get a sum of squared errors of being 0.6118. Which means mean squared error is just sum of squared errors by bytes degrees of freedom, which is a sample size minus the number of groups. 0.6118 divided by 6 is equal to 0.10197. So the mean squared error is 0.10197. So now, let's put this information, let's erase this formula just a second, put this information into what's called an ANOVA table. And you'll see an ANOVA table located on page 256 in the textbook. So probably want to have 256 open as we put this into tabular form. So looking at the book on that page, we see that the title row for the ANOVA table starts with source, goes on with degrees of freedom, sums of squares, mean squared, then F statistic, which we still have to calculate, and then P for the P value. There's three sources. There's the within. There's the between, and there's the total. By the way, by source, we mean the source of the variation, or the source of the error, or the source of the residuals, or the source of the deviation. Degrees of freedom within. Degrees of freedom within is just degrees of freedom. Do I have this right? Nope, I've got those switched. Yeah, I'll go ahead and keep the tape running. Should be between, then within. Okay. Degrees of freedom between, this is DFB. Call that DFB is equal to the number of groups minus 1, so that's going to be 2 in this case. Degrees of freedom within, or degrees of freedom error, DFE, or DFW, if you're going to Dallas, Fort Worth. This is equal to the sample size minus the number of groups. So this is going to be 6 for us. And then the total degrees of freedom, as always, is just n minus 1. And this is capital N. There were 9 data points. 9 minus 1 is 8. Sum of squared between, we calculated that to be 7.0664. That was quite a while back. Uh, sum of squares within or sum of squared error. We just calculated that to be 0.6118. And if we want to, we can calculate the sum of squared total, because we remember back that the sum of squared total is just the sum of squares between plus the sum of squares within. I can do this by hand. 4 plus 8 is 12, 618. 617, 6, 7.6782. That's going to be the sum of squared total. 
Again, notice that the degrees of freedom add up. Sum of squares add up. That's all that adds up. Mean squares don't add up. So then the mean squared between is just the sum of squares between divided by the degrees of freedom between. 3.5332. Mean squared within, or mean squared error, is going to be the mean, sum of squares error divided by the degrees of freedom. That's going to be 0 0.10, what was that? 197, was it? The mean squared total is left blank. The F statistic is just the ratio of the mean squared between to the mean squared within. So the F is going to be 3.5332 divided by 0 0.10197. I'll let you figure what that is. I have 34.65. This divided by this gives us that. And that's why it was kind of important back here for me to put between on top, because it's, we usually write top divided by bottom. And that gives us the F. And now p-value. Well, p-value, we know that the F statistic is distributed according to an F distribution. And we can go to the back of our textbook, look for the F distribution. Those distributions, or those tables, are located in Appendix A. And the F distribution is tabled in Appendix A.4. There we go. There's four Table A.4s. There's a.4a, a.4b, a.4c, a.4d. The, the last letter corresponds to the alpha level. So a.4d looks at an alpha level 0 0.005. 4 sig is alpha 0.01. B is an alpha level of 0 0.025. And A is our alpha level of 0 0.05. And that's going to be our default. So we've got an F of 34.65, and I'm in table A4A, which is page 731. I've got to determine what the numerator degrees of freedom are, and the denominator degrees of freedom. 2 and 6. So I'm looking at 2, going down to 6. The critical value is 5.14. The critical value is 5.14 which means if that F ratio is greater than 5.14, we reject at the alpha equals 0.04 level, at the alpha equals 0.05 level. 34.65 is greater than 5.14. Therefore, at the alpha equals 0.05 level, we reject the null hypothesis that there is no difference in the averages of these three fertilizers. Let's go to table A4B. Numerator degrees of freedom is 2, denominator is 6. Table A4B, which has a p-value uh, alpha of 0 0.025, critical value is 7.26. Our observed test statistic is greater than 7.26, therefore we can also reject at the alpha equals 0 0.025 level. <clears throat> Table A4C, where alpha is 0 0.01, again, 2 numerator degrees of freedom, 6. Denominator degrees of freedom, critical value is 10.9. We observe something greater than 10.9, so we can also reject at the alpha equals 0 0.01 level. We're doing a lot of rejecting here. Table A4D, where alpha is 0 0.005. Two numerator degrees of freedom, six denominator degrees of freedom, critical value is 14.5. What we observe is greater than 14.5, therefore we can also reject at the alpha equals 0 0.005 level. And that's the end. So for every possible alpha level that we have in the back of the book, we can reject the null hypothesis. Notice we still have a blank here, though. We are, using tables in the back of the book, unable to actually fill in this last square. We don't know what the p-value is.
we know a lot. We know that we can reject the null hypothesis at the point zero, 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 five level, all the levels that we looked at, which is very, very strong evidence that there is a difference in at least one of the means. But we don't know what the p-value is. And we can't get that p-value until we use technology. Either our TI-84 calculator, which tells me the p-value is 5.06 times 10 to the negative fourth. Or some computer program. So at this point, the next video that you watch is going to either be the R video or the SAS video, showing you how to do these calculations using the computer. Now realize that for the test, you are going to have to be able to do these calculations by hand in simple cases. I will not require you to calculate p-values by hand, since you can't do it. But you can determine what the critical values are. You can test null hypotheses, therefore. You can determine if you fail to reject or if you succeed in rejecting that null hypothesis. So for the midterm, for the final, make sure you can do this. For real life, make sure that you can use SAS or R to do this. So here we are. That was our by hand example. And I did actually use some functions on the TI-84 calculator to do all this nice and easily. And for those who have an 84, it's under stat, tests, and then the very last test, which is H, is ANOVA. You put the data, I erased the data. You put the data for fertilizer A into list one, fertilizer B into list two, fertilizer three, uh, fertilizer C into list C. Then you select ANOVA, then it's ANOVA, then you specify the list, so L1, comma, L2, comma, L3, in parenthesis, hit enter, and it gives all this information. So if you're stuck on a desert island, all you have is a TI-84 or 83 calculator, you can still do a NOVA. So rest assured. So you're next. So either to R or to SAS.